Okay, hello. Let's get started, shall we? This is the last talk of the day. Yay. <laughs> Tom, you haven't even been here. So this is, <laughs> so, so this is, this is about Java 9 juggling the jigsaw. My name is Mark Reinhold. I work on Java as I have for many years. So, speaking of, of many years, Java is, uh, is my goodness, 20 years old. Well, now it's actually a little over 20 years old. Uh, I think mean, Simon Ritter pointed out on, on, on Twitter just a few days ago, we have the actual 20th anniversary of Java 1.0 being released on January 26th, I believe it was. So the birthday has actually finally passed. 20 years, how, how did Java survive this long? What, uh, what, what, what methods have, have helped it survive? Well, one, one big one is the conservative manner, fairly conservative manner in which it's, it's, been, it's been evolved. Our, our general method here has always been to identify a pain point, you know, something that's making it hard to use the platform, figure out what the missing abstraction is, and then design an abstraction that addresses the pain point and hopefully fits in well with everything that we've already got. So the missing abstraction might be really simple, a missing method, a missing class, maybe a package, whatever. Uh, it, it might be big, it might something be something big and deep like generics or lambda or, 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 or something of, of, of that nature. Now the goal here is not to keep up with fashion. I, mean, they're, they're, I, remember, I remember having conversations in, in the early 2000s where people would say, oh look, at C Sharp has all these cool language features, you've got to add all of those to Java right now. Well, no. no. <laughs> the, the, the point has been to improve de developer productivity. You know, make, make people more productive, uh, make, make programs more, more efficient, and not just keep up with, with the latest trends. So we, we've always tried to, tried to, to, to stay true to Java's core, core values of readability and simplicity and universal, universality and compatibility. Um, so just to, to talk about a, a, a few of the, of the more obvious examples, in Java 5, we did generics. Why did we do generics? Because they were cool? Uh, no, we did them because working with collections was just extraordinarily painful. They were basically dynamically typed. You make yourself a list of strings, and you pull a string out of it, and all the compiler knows is, oh, it's an object. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you have to cast it to a string, and you miss a cast, and you get a runtime exception later on, and it's just you know, just too, too tedious for words. So that, you know, that kind of problem was me. That was the pain point that motivated generics. In Java 8, we introduced lambdas. We introduced lambdas because they're cool. We introduced lambdas because I can actually hold this pattern. Uh, we introduced lambdas because it was just too painful to abstract over code as data. It was too abstract, to, too hard to, to abstract over behavior. Sure, you could do it with inner classes, but who actually wants to do it with inner classes? Um, so, so there, so there we got lambdas and enabled not 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 only more compact code, but enabled the streams API, which in turn enables uh, a, a lot of computation on multi-core processors to be expressed in a fairly a fairly short amount of code, and, and that's great. So in nine, we're trying to address two different pain points. One is is the brittle and error from the class path, uh, and the other is the massive and monolithic. JDK. Uh, we, we think the missing abstraction, the common solution, both of these problems is, is modules. So that's what we've been working on in Project Jigsaw for, oh, a while now. Uh, we, 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 so I, I actually started working on this project in the summer of 2008. As, uh, as my colleague Stuart Marks would observe, that was an entire stock ticker symbol ago. Uh, so yeah, it's it's been going on for a while, but it, but it, it, it is a long-term investment, uh, and, and we're, we're going to finish it. So let's look at each pain point in turn. The class path. So I, I probably everybody in, in this room knows about the class path and its pain. If you don't, you can look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> Jar hell. Jar hell is a term similar to DLL hell, used to describe all the various ways in which the class floating process can end up not working. <laughs> yeah. Here's a class path. 
This is for, this is is for an actual system that actually is is used in production quite a bit to do serious computation. This is the Hadoop class pass. Now Hadoop is if you look at it, it's actually a really well engineered system. We've spent some time studying it, using it as a as a case study for modulariz modularization. Um, you know, it's it's clear that you know, they they've tried to keep the Hadoop components. Um, logically designed, you know, reasonably separated, so good separation of concerns and all, all of that stuff, so that it's so that it's easy to, to evolve and maintain. But nonetheless, when you go to run the do, uh, the once you get through all the all the startup scripts and everything, this is the class path that you're using. I, there are 110 jar files on this class path. I, I've I've seen class paths much longer than this. <laughs> in Oracle products, it's scary. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so you could ask some questions about this class path. Is anything missing? <laughs> yes, <laughs> probably. <laughs> are there any conflicts? Yes. Oh, I, there are. There are definitely conflicts in, in, in here. Um, if if some of the APIs and some of these Hadoop components are actually like meant to be internal to Hadoop and not used by uh, by outside code, are they being used by outside code? Yeah, probably. Who knows? Uh, and if some, if if, if, you, if the answer to one of these questions is, is is not a happy answer, when will you find out? Well, you'll probably get a runtime exception. You might get a runtime exception. You might get a wrong answer. You might never find out. Who knows? So the fundamental problem here is that the class path. You know, for once, we have an abstraction that's well named. It's the class path. Right? It's the class path, not the component path. The class path is a way to look up. Classes, regardless of what component in, they're in um, or their or their <coughs> intended use, so it really is. You know, the, the VM looks at you know the, the fact that it's that something's in foo.jar is irrelevant to the VM. It's, it just starts at the front and it looks at the first jar file and the second and third and the fourth and fifth until it finds a class or it reaches the end and throws a class death not found exception. So jar files are not components. They're just containers of classes, undifferentiated. When you think about it, it's amazing that systems this large can even work. <laughs> okay, class path, monolithic JDK. So there are several aspects of, of, of pain around the monolithic JDK. One is that, well, you can't stick it into small devices very easily. <coughs> Uh, small devices these days are generally a little bigger than the small devices we in 2008 even when we started this project. But but it's it's still an issue. Uh, a lot of these devices have processors that are perfectly capable of running a, a an SE class virtual machine. But when you're putting one of these devices in in some something that's going to be manufactured in the tens of thousands or millions, you don't necessarily don't necessarily want to pay. For the memory to carry around a full JDK when you're only going to use a little bit of it. Now it turns out it's this is also a problem even on big devices, right? Sure, a machine like this has lots of memory and lots of disk, but if you're trying to cram as many you know, Docker containers or, or, or whatever into it, uh, if each container has its own full JDK, but your application is only using a teeny part of it, then that's a waste of space. Another aspect of, of the monolithic system is that, well, it's been developed as a monolithic system from the very beginning. Uh, this was the, the module graph we came up with when we first started modularizing the JDK itself. Now, over the years, we tried on kind of an informal basis to prevent stupid kinds of, 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 of dependencies. I remember a case, and I, I think it was 1.2, where somebody thought it would be a good idea to put in Java Lang system some methods to return AWT icons for you know the running application. Um, for, fortunately, we we saw that and scratched our heads and thought mm, that's not a good idea. So there was a fair amount of informal enforcement of a model graph that didn't exist except maybe notionally in, in our heads. Um, so we, we, since we never had tools to define proper components, people could use just what they needed. <coughs> if you were here this morning for the talk that Dalibor and Rory gave, they noted six deprecated methods, methods that were deprecated eight and eight are being and are being removed in nine. They're being removed in nine because they made it hard to made it impossible to simplify this module graph 
uh, because there was a, an unfortunate dependence on something that's basically inside the AWT. So anyway, you, we're trying to build a clean module graph. Uh, we, we, we've got this monolithic system. Uh, is the class path the right tool for the job to deliver the final result? Well, no. Um, jar files aren't components. You have the same kinds of questions you can ask. Is anything miss, missing? How do you cons how do you ensure consistency in building it from compile time to, to, to run time? Is it safe to change internals? We really don't want to have to ask these questions of the platform itself. The, you know, the platform itself, of all things, should be the thing that we understand in the, in the deepest fashion. So it's a monolithic system. Um, it's also a monolithic system without boundaries. There are lots of APIs in the JDK. Um, some of them are internal and some are not. The ones that are internal have been named by convention. They either start with sun.star or they have internal somewhere in the name. Um, they are sadly often used by libraries and applications despite the fact that we've been putting up warning signs for many, many years. Here's a page from the Internet Archive. Let's see, what was the date? Ah, yes, February 15th, and you can see this 1998. Why developers should not write programs that call Sun packages. In fact, such a program is not guaranteed to work even in future versions on the same platform if it uses one of these unsupported parts of the platform. Did this help? Well, yeah, it might have deterred a few people, but you know, um, you know. Having said that, it, you know, I, I I understand, and I think most of us who work on the JDK understand there are sometimes legitimate reasons to go use internal APIs if it's for something that you, you really have no other way to do, maybe short of writing native code or changing the JDK itself. Uh, but what's some, what's sometimes frustrating to those of us who work on the JDK is people who are not just you know late. Lazy programmers in a good way, but lazy programmers in a bad way. Oh, I need to decode some base 64. Oh, look, some this base 64 to go base 64 to code. Oh, I'll use that. Sure, no problem. Uh, oh, I'm not supposed to use it. Ah, whatever. I'll use it. Anyway. anyway, so this has all been a significant maintenance burden for those of us who work on the JDK. It, it makes us fairly conservative about changing what should have been internal APIs. It also and so it it, it makes evolution difficult. Another issue is, well, it's difficult to secure the platform. You might have heard Java security. Yeah, it's been, been a problem. It's better, a lot better now than it was a few years ago. One aspect of that problem is that there just aren't these aren't boundaries. If you look at all the packages in, in the Java runtime environment, well, a bunch of them, you know, they start with Java dot, and yeah, you're allowed to use those. Um, there are a bunch that, that, that are dot internal. There are a bunch that start with some dot. And there's no way, I mean, never, never mind, you know, la lazy developers writing code that use these. Um, there, there's, no, there's no way to, pre to prevent, you know, to, to allow access from one of, one of these packages to one of these internal packages uh, without also giving access to one of these packages to everybody else. Because all we've got is package privates, right? So what do we do? If, you know, if you're running, if you're trying to run um, with the security manager to maintain a secure environment, you wind up depending on a thing, this one method in Java Lang Security manager called, manager called Check Package Access. Now that one method needs to be invoked by, by any code in the JDK that might access one of these internal packages because it's the only way to prevent sandboxed code from accessing code in these internal packages, which you can do all sorts of interesting things, and you get access to some gun safe, and, and, and away you go. The thing about check package access is, if you forget to call it somewhere, the failure is not going to be obvious. It's a little bit like the memory barriers Andrew was talking about this morning. You know, all your unit tests could be totally fine. Um, you could even you know, run, it, run in production for a while, but until you're up against an actual adversary, uh, and we've seen some very clever adversaries, uh, you won't find out that you're missing a check package access call. Uh, and it turns out uh, three of the five zero-day vulnerabilities that have been
been discovered since uh, Java 7 GA were due to the same check package access calls. This, this is not a happy place to be. All right, finally, monolithic system performance. The peak performance of Java these days, of course, is, is generally very good. We often beat, beat C++. Uh, but startup performance continues to be a frustrating problem. With all of this stuff to initialize and all of these, these sort of weird random interconnections, um, there's, just, there's a lot of work that happens that you usually don't need to do. But because it's a monolithic system, you do it. All right. Monolithic system, class path. The proposal here, the, we, we, we think at this point, the missing abstraction, the common solution to, to, to these problems is to introduce a concept of module to the platform. So as proposed, this is not a layer above the platform. It's not just a library or a framework that, that, you, that you download from Maven or whatever and just use, but it's actually a fundamental new kind of program component that's expressed in the language and implemented in both the runtime system and the virtual machine. It goes well beyond the class path to provide two key properties. One is reliable configuration, and the other is strong encapsulation. So how do modules fit into what we already have? Well, the ontology of, of container-like concepts in Java, we've got classes and interfaces. You can organize methods and, me methods and fields into, into classes and, and interfaces. Uh, there's recursion here, right? You can also organize classes and interfaces into classes and interfaces using nested classes, if you're into that sort of thing. You can organize, you, you organize classes and interfaces into packages, and now with modules you can organize packages into modules, at least at, at the Java level. So, so a module is a container of packages. A module describes how it relates to other modules. So it names the modules upon which it, which it depends, and it exports specific of its packages for use, but only by the modules that depend upon it. Now, how do we define a module? Well, we write some code. Here's the definition of a module. It says, here's a module, and its name is com.foo.bar. This is a module declaration. You write this in the Java program. It names the modules upon which it depends. So we, we see here com.foo.bar requires com.foo.baz. It exports specific packages for use by the modules that depend upon it. So it exports com.foo.bar.alpha and com.foo.bar.beta. Got any wild cards? No. Nope. Where do module dec declarations go? Well. It's Java code, so you stick it in a .java file. By convention, they go in files named module-info.java, following the, the tradition of package-info.java. The dash is there because that makes it not be a valid class name. So tools won't get confused, and people won't get confused either. What do we do with this? Well, what do you do with a .java file? Compile it. Very good. Yes, you compile it. And what do you get? You get a module into about class. They're usually really teeny, but that's okay. So module declarations are in the language. That makes them available <coughs> in all phases, from compile time to runtime. It also makes them independent of the artifact format. You know, we could use these, these in, in, in jar files or whatever comes after jar files. And it also fits in nicely with current build pipelines. We don't need to teach, you know, maybe change all the tools for some new kind of file that sits on the side and somehow has to be tracked along with everything else. It's just another .java file, another class file. OK, you compile your module info. You compile a bunch of, of class file of, of regular Java classes. What do you do with them to package them up to make them a module? Well, we could have invented a new format. but. We think a better solution for most kinds of code will be things that, that we're calling modular jar files. So a modular jar file is a jar file. Uh, it has a module info about class at its root. But otherwise, it's the you know, same, same old thing. You've got class files. You've got a manifest. You can stick, stick other stuff in there. Um, the beauty of modular jar files is that if you build them properly, <coughs> then, you, then if you're 
say, a library maintainer, you can, you can publish the same jar file that can be used on the class path on Java 8 and as a module in Java 9. In, in, in Java 8 will just ignore the module info in that class file. Java 9 would see it and use it and, and treat your component as a module. All right, so we've got our Confu bar module that requires Confu baz. Here's, a, here's the Confu baz module declaration. Uh, it, it exports a package, and suppose we've got Confu app, our actual application. Uh, it requires Confu bar and we're do some <laughs> SQL. Uh, it doesn't export anything, it's the application it doesn't need to export. Okay, what about platform modules? There's a, the suggests there ought to be a platform module for Java, for Java.sql, the JDBC API. What module has Java line object in it? Well, we use the same kinds of declarations to define all of those. So let's look at this picture again. This, this is where we started. Uh, the, the red thing up here, this is the base module, the, ba the, you know, the, the module that, basically, the module that has Java line object in it. You always have to have the base module. This was our, our initial attempt at the module graph for the JDK. Um, if you just wanted to write you know, the trivial Hello World app, how many modules do you think you would need? <laughs> well, you know, and of course you do that by, by looking at base and taking its transitive closure. Boom. <laughs> so to print Hello World, I need, um, I need Jack's P. Um, I need Corbin. <laughs> I need uh, you know, a scripting engine. Sure, why not? JavaScript and after hello. So th this, is just, you know, this is an example of the kinds of technical debt you find in large systems. Uh, so you know, surprise, surprise. So after, after many years, uh, much of which I did not do, my colleagues did, uh, we, we threw, threw tricks both obvious and non-obvious, and there's a whole other talk, at least in, in how to do this sort of thing. We eventually wound up with a much cleaner module graph. So this is the what will, this is close to pro probably what, what will be proposed as the, S, the Java SE9 standard module graph. So this is, is showing all, all of the module, modules that comprise the SE9 platform uh, and their relationships. This is the transitive reduction, if you remember your, your graph theory. So there are more edges in the full graph than appear here. But this one fits on the slot. So bases at the bottom. Does it depend on anything else? Java SE is at the top, you could, you could write your app and just say, oh yeah, I require Java SE, and you'll get the entire platform, and you could just ignore the fact that there are modules underneath it. So the base module is defined by a module declaration. This is the first part of it, it's, it's a bit longer. Uh, key things about the base module, well, every module implicitly requires java.base. Uh, if you write a mo your own module declaration and you, you don't need to write requires java.base, you can if you want, but you don't need to. It's, it will be inserted by the compiler for you. Java.base is the only module that doesn't require any others. It's also, interestingly, the only module that's known specifically to the language in the VM. So all the other modules in the graph I showed you, yeah, they're there at runtime. They're part of the runtime system, but the VM has no clue about them until they're loaded. So we've got this from Java.base, we've got a bunch of other declarations for all of the other modules. How do we, plat how do we package up these, these platform modules? Well, some of them, uh, and generally the new, more the ones that are near the bottom of the graph and at the top, have native code in them and, you know, and licensed stuff and man pages and other kinds of things that you typically don't find in jar files. So we invented a new format. It's a pretty simple format. We, we, we call it JMOD. It's basically jar files, on, uh, jar, jar files on steroids. You can't use a JMOD as a jar file. In fact, you can't even really use it at runtime. It's meant, meant uh, strictly as, as a transport format. Um, at the moment, we're using the zip format because it's convenient. We might change it to, to some better format later. But it, 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 it breaks out classes from executables, from native libraries, from configuration stuff. Um, and it basically gives us everything we need to deliver a JDK build, not only as an entire image, but as a set of modules that you can mix, mix and match as you need. Okay, so we've got our, 
application library modules, we've got the platform modules taken together, we think of these as the universe of observable modules. If we were looking at the femtosecond before JVM startup, okay, boom, here, here are the modules we might consider. If we're about to invoke the compiler here, here are the modules the, the compiler might consider as, a, as it's going to compile some code. So to make use of the observable modules at either compile time or runtime, we have to figure out how they relate to each other based just on what this app needs. Now, remember your graph theory. What's the computation we're going to do? Anybody? Euler? Transitive closure? Hey. So, we're going to build a graph. Confu app requires Confu bar and Java.sql. OK, here we go. Confu bar, Java.sql. Uh, oh, yeah, and it requires Java base because everything requires Java base, remember? But you don't have to write it. Confu bar, in turn, requires Confu baz um, and Java base. Confu baz doesn't require anything, it's just Java base. Java SQL requires logging, everybody's favorite logging API. Yeah. And Java XML, and it requires Java base. And logging requires Java base. XML requires Java base. Okay, there's there's our our initial module graph. So the module graph defines the notion of readable modules, uh, and, and readable modules are the basis of reli reliable configuration. That first property that I mentioned. Reliable configuration lets us tell when things are missing. It lets us tell when there are are, are conflicts. For example, suppose in, con in the Confu app module declaration we wrote requires Confu whatever. But there actually isn't a Confu whatever at compile time or runtime. Well, what happens? At compile time, you get a helpful error message. Error, module not found Confu app with a pointer to uh, the, your, your mention of Confu whatever. Suppose you manage to compile this through, through some mistake or subterfuge or, or, or who knows what. You, you go to run it. Error occurred during initializ initialization of VM. Module confu whatever not found required by confu app. There you go. Rather than waiting until you know, sometime after your application has been running for 10 minutes, you find out right away that something that's going to be needed is missing. Explain the command line arguments. Uh, what kind? Uh, the command line arguments, um, sure, java-np, in, in the Jigsaw build, there's a concept of module path, the class path, but it's for modules. Uh, and dash n says the main module is going to, is going to be the one confu app. Go find its main method, which is declared out of band in a manner that I can explain later if we have time. All right. So that's reliable configuration. We've got our module graph. What about strong encapsulation? Well, remember the other kind of statement in a module declaration is an export. So we can walk through those and annotate our module graph. Confu app, well, it's the application, so it, so it doesn't export anything. Confu bar exports Confu bar alpha and Confu bar beta, so we'll add those here. Baz exports Confu baz mumble. SQL exports java.sql and java.x.sql. Logging exports logging. XML exports, JavaX.XML, Java and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then we're done. Oh, wait, Java.Base, yeah, that's important, isn't it? OK, Java.Base exports a whole, a whole slew of packages. OK, so the exports define the notion of accessible types. A, a, some, some code in one module can access a type in another module. If the first module reads the second module, there's an error. And if the second module exports the package containing that type, both of those conditions have to be true for access to be granted. And this is the basis of strong encapsulation. Now again, as, as, with, as with readable types, we, we're, we try to give detailed error messages when things go wrong. Imagine that the confu bar module has an internal package called confu bar beta internal. And there's some public beta impl class in it. If in confu app we import that class and even go and instantiate it, well, at compile time, we will get an error. 
Beta impl is not accessible because package confu bar beta internal is not exported. And there's the instantiation. Which you can now go fix. If you actually manage to compile this because it's you know, due, due to some out of base compilation thing and you run it, you will also get a runtime exception, a legal access error. And this is fairly long, but it's long, it, it's long so that you can, can go fix the problem. Class compu app main in module compu app cannot access class compu bar beta internal beta impl in module compu bar. Um, compu bar beta internal is not exported to compu app. If you, you know, if you did this right, you could like, do a whole Dr. Seuss book. Okay. So to recap the essence of the module system, we have module declarations written in the Java programming language. They're compiled into module info.class files. Modules are packaged into modular jar files, or if you're working on the JDK or something else that has to have native code and stuff in it, you need JMOD files. We have the notion of observable, of observable modules. We start with that uh, in, in any particular phase. We, we use the concept of readable modules to construct a module graph. That gives us reliable configuration. We interpret export statements to determine accessible types, which give us strong encapsulation. <coughs> And these two properties are enforced uniformly at both compile time and runtime. So the configurations of large systems are essentially they're correct by construction, or at least way more correct than they are today. OK, going back to our pain points, let's see how modules address them. Size. So as we've seen, modules let us use only what we need. But how does that work out? If you're, if you're trying to, to, to fit something into a small system, you know, it's great that we can construct this module graph at runtime, but if the observable modules included all of our, you know, the entire JDK, uh, does that mean that the entire JDK is still going to have to go onto our small device? Well, no, because we're introducing a new tool. So a new optional step between compile time and runtime is link time. Around 20 years ago, I had, I, when I first started working on Java, I remember asking James, um, James Gosling, so does Java have a linker? And the answer to that, of course, was, well, no, of course not, because it's all dynamically linked all the time. Um, well, we're, int we're introducing a linker. It's optional, but, it, but it's a linker, so obviously it has to be called JLink. JLink is a tool that consumes jar files and JMod files. It runs the resolution and configuration computation to, to create a module graph, and then it puts into a custom JRE image just the modules that are in that graph. And it, and it can also do a bunch of uh, pre-computation of other stuff. So you can make a custom image that has just what you need. If you only need java.base because you're going to embed, you know, you're, you're going to burn the Hello World app you know, onto your, your Atom board, and you can do that. For performance, um, we're, we're, we're doing some direct work around performance. A big part of what we're doing for performance in 9 is, is enabling future stuff. So we don't expect dramatic performance improvements in 9, but we're trying to lay the groundwork for some dramatic performance improvements later on. Uh, Dalibor touched on this in, in his session this morning. We're changing the structure of, of the JDK, the Java, Java runtime environment as delivered. Here is a, a summary of what it looks like today. There's a bin directory with commands in it, a lib directory with other stuff in it, in it including rt.jar and .so's and random properties things uh, and, and, and whatnot. We're changing this in 9. In fact, we changed this in 9 quite some time ago. Um, there's now you know, pro properties, files, and, and, and other kinds of configuration files that are, that are meant to be possibly edited by humans, but actually often aren't, are going in their own configuration directory, so they're easy to find. Um, native stuff is, is all going in, in, into the lib directory. Those need to be at least somewhat easy to find because some applications link to these directly if they're using the JNI invocation API. And then the rest is dot, 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 which on this slide is shorthand for never you mind. These things are gone. Dalibor mentioned, mentioned these this morning. The endorsed standards directory is gone. The extension directory is gone. Um, they, they added a lot of complication and you know, with some surveys and, and, and looks at, you know, look 
looking at a bunch of existing code out in the world, we find out, found out that what, uh, not many people actually use them. RT.jar is gone. Now, of course, there is a, you know, obviously a, a JRE is going to have a bunch of classes baked into it, uh, but they're in a file in dot, dot, dot. Uh, the format of this file is not documented, except in the source code. And that's intentional, because we want to preserve the right to change it, even in a minor or a micro release. You know, if we need to change it in a patch release, we will do that. Do not write code that depends on the format of anything in dot, dot, dot. Yes, the same kind of warning I made at the beginning, but you know. <laughs> I mean, there, there's, a, 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 at this level of the system, there's no practical way to prevent people. And if you really want to, yeah, you can go and dig into this. You know, feel free. But, you know, do not come crying when the next update release break, breaks your app. Um, you know, and, and, you know, both at Sound and Oracle, we, we, we tell the same thing to, to customers here. Oh, you want, you want to escalate an issue for you know, your use of a deeply internal API? Eh. <laughs> but some we would, we would usually say no at Oracle. Um, it's like you know, double the price or something. <laughs> 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 All right, so. So, excellent question. There is, in fact, an API. Um, E, well, yeah, yes, there, yes, there, 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 there is a public API, and it turns, and it turns out, well, it's, it's actually just an instance of an IO file system. So, if you're writing, if you're writing an IDE or some other kind of tool that needs to inspect the classes in the JDK, uh, you can, you can get access to this NIO virtual file system that surfaces the stuff that used to be in RT.jar. You can explore it, it's indexed by both modules and, and packages so you can find things efficiently. Um, this, this went into, into 9 over a year ago, so most of the tools by now have, have it added. And that is an interface that we intend to support you know, for the next 20 years at least, probably. So with this new format, um, you know, J JLink creates creates all of this for you, and JLink has plugins that can do interesting kinds of op optimizations. Um, that that plugin idea is how we expect a lot of future work uh, to be expressed ahead of time. Compilation can be expressed as a plugin. We already have plugins that will do um, more compression than usual if you're really trying to, to save on space and things like that. All right, I'm actually running short on time. So internal APIs, uh, Valibor touched on this more. The, on this also this morning, broadly used internal APIs that are critical, you know, for which you cannot write a, a, a replacement into your Java will remain available until they have an effective standard replacement. <coughs> Others will be strongly encapsulated. The ultimate workaround is a command line flag. Yes, it is possible with command line flags to probe into anything, uh, and it's painful when you have to write long command lines, but you know what? I have no sympathy. To get ready for all of this, yes, run the JDEPS tool. Alibor mentioned this this morning. Uh, JDEPS is actually in, it's in JDK 8. So you have JDK 8, you have an early version of JDEPS. The JDEPS that's in 9 is even better. The JDEPS that is in the Jigsaw build is even better than that. Uh, so if you, if you really want to get going, then, then, then get a Jigsaw build. As to the class path pain point, well, we're providing tools here, right? We're, we're providing the tools with which people who maintain and chip code can, can get the benefits of reliable configuration and strong encapsulation. Uh, migration is, has been a very big concern of ours. We're, we're trying to design this so that you can migrate an existing system either from the top down or from the bottom up or some combination of the two. And that's tricky, but we're, we're, we're trying to steal some of the tricks uh, that we learned for, for generic types so that you don't have to modularize everything before you can even use the modules. It is a long road, right? We, we do not expect modules to be adopted as rapidly as some other features, or Java 9 to be adopted as rapidly as some of the releases. Uh, some of the changes are admittedly disruptive, but we think they'll be worth the cost. The nature, the nature of the feature, in some ways, is just not that exciting. <coughs> Lambda was really cool. Lambda was a jetpack. You, you, know, you, 
could explain Lambda at a high level, and then somebody could go write code that uses Lambda and we uses the Streams API pretty quickly. You didn't have to change much of anything else. You didn't have to you know, get the right version of, of Maven and Eclipse that would actually, you know, that would actually, sorry, you wouldn't have to change Maven. You had to, you had to get a new IDE probably to understand Lambda. But the point is you, you could get going quickly. Modules are more of a seatbelt. They're a safety feature. If you use them wisely, it will be easier to build large systems. It will be, be easier to make them go faster, and, and as, as well as build them more quickly. Jigsaw itself has been a long road. As I mentioned, we started in 2008. But it's another one of these long-term investments, like generics or Lambda. It takes time to get right. It takes time to get you know, all, all the right feedback, uh, because we don't want to put the wrong thing into the platform. But we think it will be a strong foundation for the future. How to learn more. Uh, Jigsaw is at this URL over JDK. Da, 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 Jigsaw. We've got five JEPs. We've got an entire JSR for the model system itself. Uh, we have early access builds updated. They're now updated uh, not just every week. Uh, unlike the, the JDK 9 early access builds, the Jigsaw builds are now updated at, at least at least once a day, assuming that changes are, are, are still happening in the code base. So it, it's not on every commit, but it's, it's at least one, once a day if anything did change. I work for Oracle. <laughs> oh, do you want to see that again? There you go. Uh, I did not make all those images by hand, or by any good ones. And I am two and a half minutes over. Thank you very much.